Linda McMahon, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. It's great to be with you, Ben. Thanks for having me on. I want to talk to you about a number of different things. Uh, but first off, I just want to ask you a little bit about your non-political life and the family business that you've been a part of for so long. Um, in recent years, wrestling terminology, it seems like, has gone mainstream. People know the different terms. Uh, you know, some people, they know what a shoot is. Uh, they know kind of the, the different terminology and the different uh, uh, expressions for, for heel turns and the like. And obviously, you know, some of the biggest actors in America today are former pro wrestlers. What do you think about the situation of seeing everything that came out of really your family business uh, turn into something that is such a culturally dominant phenomenon? Well, Ben, clearly it's very pleasing uh, and exciting to see that. But we always thought that, you know, we were part of the American mainstream culture. I mean, it, it didn't matter if it was in the United States or if we traveled abroad, there was someone who always had a wrestling story. So I think it gets down to the fact that everyday people, you know, experience things in their lives. Like, for instance, uh, I had a gentleman who told me one time when my grandmother came over and she couldn't speak any English. She came over from Italy. She couldn't speak any English, but she had to watch wrestling every single week. She had to watch WWF at the time. And she really learned a lot of words, you know, by watching wrestling, but she was always so enthusiastic about it. I had a mother two weeks ago who said to me, boy, I had such a great time taking my children to a wrestling event, a WWE event that was in Texas and had no idea what I was going to see. But my son's birthday had come up and this is what he wanted to do. And so we took some friends and got some tickets. She said, I never had such a good time. Uh, and she said so many family families were there and such a diverse crowd, uh, you know, at the uh, arena watching the event. So I really believe that so much of WWE's success is because it is really grassroots and you go WWE goes into the community. So the live event is there, but it works with, uh, you know, children's hospitals. It works with uh, organizations for non-bullying. And so it really does become part of of, I think, America's, you know, everyday uh, activities. And I think that's why you've seen so much of it, you know, having been adopted. In a sense, do you feel like what you all did with building up wrestling as a national phenomenon kind of presaged the current cultural dynamic and the embrace of everything that has to do with superheroes? These really are kind of real life comic book characters. If you, if you get right down to it, you know, superheroes, you can actually see in kind of that, you know, mythic or legend uh, way, especially for, for young boys. Uh, is that, was that something that was in your mind as you were going through the experience of building this company? Or was it something that kind of came to fruition organically? Well, first of all, let me say that I had absolutely nothing to do with building the characters. Uh, I'm not, I, was, I was never the creative side of the company or, you know, or the business at all. Mine was more focused on the business side and some of the characters that, uh, that uh, were developed, uh, I was often uh, surprised at. I mean, for one, The Undertaker. I mean, that's mm -hmm. just a character that when it first, you know, came on board, uh, just was not... Uh, something I would ever have thought of in a zillion years became one of our most popular characters. But, you know, then, then other characters who are larger than life. Uh, but, mm -hmm. you know, if you think back way back to the, the early comics and Superman and Aquaman and all of those, they were around for a long time. Uh, so WWE is a real blend of kind of that superhero character, but also, you know, the real life, the real life mm -hmm. personality as well. How hard is it to work with, people who are creatively, they have to be all over the place in terms of thinking of new ideas, you know, trying to throw spaghetti at the wall and come up with characters and things like that, while you have to handle the actual numbers to make everything work. Well, you know, it's very interesting because WWE, if you think about it, uh, at live events, uh, and there, you know, there was a time when we had one or two live events every single night, but it's not that many mm -hmm. now, but still live events, uh, three or four uh, a week uh, with each brand. And you have a live marketing audience right there. 
to give you thumbs up or thumbs down. I mean, if you introduce a character that's supposed to get booze and they get laughs, well, you know, you're not on the right track. So it's really the, an advantage of having, you know, real time marketing info and input in addition to now all of the technology that's available that uh, the WWE fans bring to, you know, the arenas and to the stadiums for the events. But, uh, but you really, you can get feedback really quickly on what's working and what's not and what storylines because, you know, the, the writing that goes into the, the soap opera drama that is played out mm-hmm. every week uh, is, really, uh, is really the hook that keeps people coming back all the time, plus the incredible in-ring action of what I believe are some of the best uh, athletes and stars in the world because they, you know, it's 52 weeks a year. There's no season to what WWE does. And these incredibly talented men and women uh, who are in the ring are actually kind of acting out that storyline uh, and with their on um, on mic and on camera work as well. So it's it's incredibly um, impressive. It's so impressive mm-hmm. to see what they do. They're not out there with a the teleprompter. You know, they no. are they're they're working on their storylines and what and whatever, you know, script and a lot of them can go off script, but as long as they are you know, within the boundaries of that. But they're they're just amazing, amazing performers. My my it's, hat it's, goes it, off to them all the time. It's a theater, it's a circus, it's death defying stunts. <laughs> and uh and so I mean the combination of that is just uh incredible in terms of uh, especially, you know, if, if it's uh, viewed through, you know, the, the eyes of a younger fan. Uh, and and I just think that, that it's such a fascinating development in terms of how popular and how sustained that popularity has been. One more question before I uh, move to <laughs> less serious topics like politics. Uh, did it, Just in terms of, of uh, recent uh, developments or anything uh, t- that has been a storyline or a character in the past couple of years that stood out to you as being something that either surprised you uh, for how popular it was uh, or that you've really cottoned on to as just being, oh, I'm I'm impressed with this. I'm impressed with this development. You know, I can't pick out one over the other, and that's not uh, – I'm not dodging your question. It is just sure. when I uh, – it, it's very interesting because uh, when the writers, especially – uh, when Vince was writing some of the storylines and uh, and I would say, OK, well, tell me what's going to happen. He says, no, 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 I don't want to tell you. I want to get your reaction to it. Uh, <laughs> I want to get your reaction to it live when it's really happening and to see, you know, if you're impressed by it, if you're disappointed by it, if you're surprised by it. And I think some of the market studies that we had done over the years indicated that one of the things that the WWE fans like the most is when they were surprised, when they thought they had it figured out and then came time for the sort of the payoff or the big reveal and it absolutely fooled them. And they love mm-hmm. that. They really mm-hmm. like the surprise. So for me personally, it's all a surprise when I sit down and watch. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's one of the things that's in common with the great television age that we're in when people think that they figured out the storyline and then something veers in the right. opposite direction. And I have to um, give you know, such incredible credit to, to the writers and the performers at WWE, because as I said, they do this 52 weeks a year. Uh, mm-hmm. And if you think there's a live programming on USA network, three hours on Monday night, two hours on Fox uh, on Friday night. So that's five hours of live programming plus all the other, you know, interstitial programming that gets done it's an amazing mm-hmm. amount of content that gets developed it was as i said a, a family business tell me about the challenges of running a family business in america today in an era in which it seems like marketplaces are dominated by global multinational corporations that are often faceless and don't have any of that kind of family element to what they do You know, I'd like to take it back even maybe a little step further, uh, Ben, because um, a family business, if you think about how Vince and I just got started, we really were a small business. Mm -hmm. And small businesses, just like today, uh, some of the things that they're facing, I mean, uh, when we first started, we didn't have collateral. We didn't own bricks and mortar. And any um, monies that we would like to borrow to get us from some events or some months to the next were really based on cash flow. So we were a small business operating in a world of where you really needed a lot of collateral, et cetera. 
But a family business, I think, is also it brings its own brings its own challenges. Uh, first of all, a husband and wife who were working together, you know, uh, every day, uh, and then go home at night, and so your uh, your business partners, your uh, spouses, and, and then your children come into uh, into the mix as well. And uh, but I think uh, basically for Vince and me personally, it, it worked out incredibly well because all of the things that he did so unbelievably well, which was all of the creative and the marketing and all of that, I could not do. Uh, mm-hmm. And I've said that, you know, many people could do my job, you know, every day, uh, but not his particular kind of, uh, I, I really do believe it's marketing genius. And so, um, you know, we, we came to work in different cars. We came and left at different times. And so um, it, it worked out really well for us. But I do think there is a family dynamic when, when you do disagree, uh, mm-hmm. you might have disagreed on maybe if it's not WWE, but you disagree on what the marketing aspect is going to be or what, what investments you make for goods and services and products. And and does that then affect how you are as a family, if it's a husband and wife or if it's siblings who were in a family business? So it does it does bring those dynamics sometimes, I think, which uh, a lot of businesses don't survive. I hear something when I go out and and speak in front of audiences uh, uh, about uh, uh, from small business owners across the country today. That's very discouraging. They basically come to me and they say, I really want to disconnect from the China supply chain. I don't want to have to be part of it. But if I do that, my business is, is going to go under. I can't afford to manufacture whatever you know uh, goods that I'm making, you know, or a specific part that is key to what I'm creating. If I disconnect from China, even if politically that's something that I'd like to achieve, I know that this is something that's important to you too. What can we do to make sure that small businesses in America, which you know are uh, interconnected with all of these different uh, nations around the world, that they have the ability? to turn to supply chains that come from either, you know, closer places to us like Canada and Mexico uh, or to nations that are more uh, allied with our interests, such as India, for instance, or or perhaps other nations in South Asia, as opposed to being dependent on the Chinese Communist Party and, and everything that they produce. Well, I think it's, it's important and incumbent upon us uh, to be able to direct those small businesses, to provide them with the information. I think that's one of the things that uh, the SBA certainly tried to do. I I know that's one of the things we tried to do when I was there to connect them with trade uh, organizations to see where it is that they could uh, get the best supply chains and also to encourage them and to help provide funding for those small businesses to themselves go over to some of the countries that might have the product that they need and to cut deals with them while they were there so that they could bypass a lot of the middlemen. And then you have to work on, then it becomes a supply chain, not just the production, but the supply chain. But it there is a way to do it, but it's all about information. And it's difficult, when it, especially when it's just easier to connect already with some of the, uh, you know, the, the trade that is available and get in. But I think ultimately the answer is we just need to manufacture more here in our country. Uh, if we could do that. And, and when, when I was at SBA and I was visiting a couple of small businesses and I was, one of them was a tractor company. And, uh, they, and, and I asked him, I said, so I said, you're buying these tractors, uh, you know, you, from, from China. And then you're selling them here in the United States. And I said, so what's what's happened? Why can't you buy them here in the United States? And he first talked about, you know, it was much cheaper. The supply, the supply chain, although sometimes took a little longer because it was coming, he said, but let me tell you what's interesting and what's happening. He said, China is building such inferior products, trying to rip off what we do. He said, I have expanded my business now into tractor repair. And he said, so I am repairing the tractors that didn't come here from the United States, but I am repairing them now. And what my customers are finding is that they are better off in the long run to buy their tractors here in the United States that are made in the United States because they're better made and it doesn't cost them as much to keep them in repair. So I heard those kind of stories and I think that's incredibly important for us to remember. You know, just similarly experiencing this with a young child, 
uh, what we found very typically was that the Chinese products that we would order um, or Chinese made products that we would order uh, would be fine, but they would break very quickly mm -hmm. or very easily. Uh, whereas the American products that we would order or products that were from, you know, Canada or Europe or the like, they would, they would be more expensive, uh, but they would actually last longer and they wouldn't fall apart. Sure. And, and so, yeah. And so that seems to be something that is, that is uh, true across a, a lot of the marketplace today. Uh, what can we do to help establish in the American consumer's mind more that buying American isn't just an act of patriotism. It's it's also in their financial interest to do so uh, because the products that they're going to get uh, are going to run longer, serve them better, uh, you know, and ultimately have uh, uh, repairers and, and people who can support them here who will be more responsive and, and able to deal with any problems that arise. Well, I think really a lot of that comes down to, you know, product availability. Mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of it, you know, is uh, the marketing promotion that companies here, you know, in the, in the United States uh, have to take on and have to assume some of that. But as more and more consumers experience what you and I have just been discussing, they will be looking for the better made and better quality product, even if it does cost a little bit more. But at the same time, I think we have to really work to make sure that we have our fair trade deals in place so that the cost of bringing those goods in uh, does get higher and higher so that there is competition here in America for those products. And I, we really need to focus on that. Tell me a little bit about the workforce development side of things. We've been through this period now where under the pandemic, you know, uh, because of a lot of the money that was flowing out of Washington, it incentivized a situation where people were essentially uh, being paid not to work. Um, they, you know, were uh, were dropping out of jobs that they had held or not moving forward because they were worried about losing access to the benefits that they were receiving from the government. When it comes to boosting this economy, which, you know, regardless of your the aspect of it that's affecting you negatively, Americans view very negatively in this moment, uh, whether it's because of inflation, whether it's because of the stock market, whether it's because of you know, a lot of, of, of shrunk capacity or, or problems with supply chains or the like, there's negative viewpoints there. How can we turn that around in terms of developing a workforce uh, that is you know, both prepared for the challenges that we have and also uh, doesn't have this massive incentive in terms of government funding to just stay out of work? Well, I think that's the first issue. We have to make sure that we're not paying people to stay home uh, you know, in, in providing those same benefits for them that they could get if they were, you know, coming to work. I think there was a certain period of time. I think a lot of this did come in under COVID. And I respected the fact that we got out, you know, the, the, the PP, and I'll never get it right, PPP or PPE program that came out uh, first under the, the Trump administration. I was not at SBA then, but I do know that that was very helpful. In spite of some of the fraud that took place, it was incredibly helpful for many small businesses who would have lost their employees to keep them, you know, for, you know, for two or three months. We had to get and who had been shut down by the government. That's right. And we had, that's yeah. just what I was, I was about to say. We were just, and we had to get the economy back open and we had to get places back up and running, but then we shouldn't have continued, you know, that, uh, that, that outreach and that handout, if you will, uh, we should have then focused on getting people back to work and people became, I think they sort of like staying at home also and working from their computers and things like that. And, and there are companies then who I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but there are also companies who then made it mandatory that you had to come back in for X number of days a week. And I think that's so important because you have to experience the culture of the business, you know, that you're working in. And it's really important to interact, you know, with your fellow employees. But, you know, there's a lot in, in the question that you posed of getting people back to work, but then and how are we training people? A lot of those people were laid off and employers found, well, I don't really need that, you know, those that many people to come back and to do the jobs that they're doing. So how do we retrain and reskill those people, you know, uh, who are out of work? And I think our community colleges can be very helpful in doing that. Uh, I think, uh, you know, we can go all the way back, you know, now into our, our whole education system, you know, that we have in our country. When we got rid of shop and we got rid of a lot of those uh, technical applications in high schools and kids didn't graduate with any of those skills. So 
I think our workforce development has gone from getting away from a skills base to more of the four-year college uh, type of, um, of environment and, and recognition. And I think that we need to now look at our economy needs skill-based workers. We need artisans. We need the people who can do those things. Uh, and they can then skill up to understand how to do that and employ the technology to be in a lot of the manufacturing firms. And so I think that, um, you know, entrepreneurs can really look at, at how they can be involved in training a lot of these programs and working with the local community colleges to say, these are the jobs that I need. This is the, um, these are the programs that you need to teach. This is what you need to do so that when these people graduate, they have jobs to go to because this is what we need. Uh, you know, in the business world. I think it's so incredibly important that we have our businesses working with not only our community colleges and technical colleges, but also with our four-year colleges to turn out the kind of graduates that are skilled to be in whatever kind of workforce that there is at that point. I want to go out with a kind of a larger philosophical question. You're a businesswoman, you're a mother, you're a grandmother. Uh, the I, there's basically been a trend in recent years of among a lot of different women, both, you know, on the right and to some degree on the left, uh, who have been very critical of the existing circumstances regarding incentives that were put in place for them to either remain in the workforce, uh, long term or to be more reluctant to, uh, have children or to form a family. They have become more open about criticizing policies that were put in place that seemed more designed on making them good workers uh, than necessarily uh, allowing for a level of income in a two-parent home or the like uh, where they could have it all uh, to a certain extent. What needs to change about the way that America approaches uh, these policies, either from a political standpoint or a business standpoint, that will allow... Uh, women to not feel forced into a dynamic where they end up trying to form a family uh, in, you know, later and later, as we see them do statistically, uh, when, you know, we see so often articles about, I wanted to have more kids, or I wish I had started earlier and the like. Um, And that's something that obviously has, you know, boosted a lot of people trying to get fertility treatments and, and other things. There are other ways around that, of, of course, but there, that does seem to be an element that we hear both from, you know, feminists, some people, uh, you know, uh, and then traditionalist conservatives as well. How can we change that dynamic? You know, it, it's really interesting because there's there's so much involved, you know, in, in that question. There are not as many, there haven't been in the past. I think it's changing, but it's not where it needs to be yet. There is uh, not much Uh, encouragement in the workforce, in the workplace, excuse me, if you will, for men to help women elevate and get to that next level. Uh, Men can often be so helpful in supporting women as they are moving more into managerial, you know, positions, and they haven't necessarily done that. Now, I'm not blaming men for that, but women sometimes need a little, uh, you know, wind beneath their wings to to try and get to those next levels. But at the same time, then if women are the ones who have to leave to go pick up children at daycare, if they're the ones who have to leave the job to go do that and and a man uh, doesn't have to do that, uh, then it's it's almost you're penalized for having done that because you can't be there till the seven, eight, nine o'clock time to work at night when perhaps a man or someone else, you know, could, could be there doing that. So you get penalized for that. And what I have found, though, recently, which I find encouraging, is that women are at a greater percentage now getting higher degrees at universities than the men are. But the downside of that is a lot of women who will major in engineering or in data analytics, et cetera, when they come out, they don't go to work in their field because that opening is not as available to them. So they also need to have the courage to step in and uh, to make sure that they are in the field where they can advance, you know, in in their own field. And I do think that uh, just, um, you know, women in in the workforce, uh, I do believe in in equal pay for equal work. I certainly do believe in that. Uh, But 
when you're judged a little bit of, well, okay, equal pay, but this person worked another two hours during the day and they're not getting overtime because they didn't have to leave and go home. That's just unfair. So I think the fact that uh, not only women, but men both can work a bit from home now, that that's more in the workplace of being um, uh, a bit more understanding. Mm -hmm. I have seen also in in, uh, my own company, you know, that there are times, periods during the day where women were allowed to leave or, or men either and go to a, ch- uh, a school activity or, or take a child to a doctor or whatever and come back. So I think that the workplace itself is being a little bit more flexible to allow that. Uh, and I think that's really, you know, where it will come down to the most. It, mm-hmm. You will attract and retain employees to stay with you if you treat them fairly. Uh, and if you have their understanding for what it is they need to do, whether it's male or female. And so trying to penalize one for having to leave early, well, they might could stay later that day, or you don't know about the four hours they worked on Saturday. So I just think it's uh, more and more understanding, you know, in the workplace for, especially for women, because when women do leave to have children, often they are then out of the workplace if they're going to have more than one for multiple years, let's say two, two to five years. Well, how much has the dynamic in the workplace changed? They almost have to reskill and reeducate to come back to work, and they've missed time. Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's a, that's an unfair advantage. Uh, it really does. It really does seem like you're talking about something that's a cultural change. Uh, it really uh, is a cultural change. Else. I think yeah. more than more than anything else, I think it is a cultural change because to try to to try to legislate that mm-hmm. just really doesn't work because each working environment is different. There are some companies that can be more flexible than others. I mean, if you have a company and a, and a, and a woman is on an assembly line and she has to be there and it's, you know, it's X number of hours and you have to be doing this amount of work, then perhaps there's a flexibility of the total hours that get worked that week. Uh, or you'll have a weekend shift or, or, or an earlier morning or later night shift. And I think there are just ways that culturally we have to look at that to be accommodating to our women, but also, you know, to, uh, to, to other employees. But mm-hmm. I think especially women are hit harder, you know, by those things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Linda McMahon, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to join me. It's been me fun. Yeah, great to talk thanks, to you. Thanks, Ben. I really appreciate it.